19th during a city council meeting. I'm sorry we don't have more space. This is a good um, a, a, a good picture to have when we need a new boardroom. Yeah. Um, and as we just said earlier, we're really glad we have reserved seats. Yes, we do. So. <laughs> row seats. And I love democracy at its best. Yes. So I am going to start by saying that we all, we, it's Thanksgiving next week. We're all feeling very grateful. It comes, it came upon us very quickly. And so I'm going to start tonight by hearing from our counselors what we might be thankful for very briefly. So I, I guess I'm supposed to start and really overwhelmingly the only thing I can think of is how thankful I am that we have such an engaged community. So thank you. I, I, my thoughts are exactly the diverse community with incredible public involvement. Thank you very much. Socially diverse, economically diverse, and uh, uh, thank you all for being here. <laughs> and, and by the way, we aren't giving away free turkeys. I don't know why you all showed up. <laughs> well, I'm thankful to live in this great community, Durango, and thanks to all of you for coming for public participation. I hope you're all going to take just three minutes. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Every morning I do my gratitude and I think of the 10 things I'm grateful for and always on the list is that my husband and I found uh, Durango. I'm also extremely grateful for citizen participation and I'll also say these days I'm grateful I didn't break my neck, my back or my legs and I have surgery tomorrow. And I too am very grateful for our passionate and engaged community. I am grateful for our dedicated and committed staff and I'm really grateful for my council members who work so hard at doing the work that we do. So thank you all for joining us and with that, Ms. Phillips, can we have a roll call please? Certainly. <laughs> Councillor Baxter? Present. Councillor Bettine? Here. Councillor Noseworthy? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Brecky? Here. And Mayor Yusuf? Here. City Council, do we have any actual or perceived conflicts of interest this evening? Okay, we're going to move right into public participation. If someone can work their way down there, or someone can hand me the list. Ah, uh, Brett, you know how to do this. It's amazing that there's only... Okay. Um, I am going to... Uh, when I call you forward, if you will please join us at the podium, if you can make work your way up. Speak your name and address, please, clearly for the record. And I'm going to suggest that um, Councillor Bettine is going to be our timekeeper. He will raise his hand at two and a half minutes. And at three and a half, three minutes, I am going to cut you off, please, this time. Um, I will, um, if I have to use the gavel, I will. I would much rather not. Um, we, we, it's, it's the position of council that if we let one person go over, we feel like we really need to be fair and let everyone go over. Um, when we have this many people in the room, we really ask that you respect our three-minute limit um, and know that we're listening actively to what you have to say, and we're really thankful that you're here. So with that, I'm going to call forward um, Beatrice Garcia. Thank you. Right here. Uh, yes, address and phone number. This is a street address. Name, name and address. Uh, name and address. Yeah, scary. Um, what you are saying. Okay. English, English is my second language, so I'm going to try to do it as quick, as fastest, and clear to you um, what I can. Okay, my name is Beatriz A. Garcia. I live in 24 Lewis Mountain, Lake Durango. I am a Hispanic mother and of three children. They attend Park Elementary School. We're here to talk about ICE policies in our community. I represent people, including immigrants like myself, who are concerned about the future of our town. We believe in the civility code that opened this city council meeting, respect, compassion, kindness, sincerity, fairness, consideration, responsibility, and acceptance. <clears throat> However, Immigration Customs Enforcement, or ICE, which is part of Homeland Security, does not follow this civil code. I am extremely concerned about ICE presence in our community, especially outside of our schools. An event that took place near Park Elementary School helps illustrate my concern I will not mention the name of the people involved to protect their identities. In late August, the day after the governor 
um, Jared police visit Park Elementary School, ICE agents followed a man his, and his daughter to school. The man dropped off his daughter while the agents watched. A few minutes later, as the man dropped to work, the ICE agents pulled him over, removed him from, from his vehicle, and took him into detention. I found that this incident several days after it happened, and I immediately contacted uh, the principal of Park Elementary School, as well as the detained man's wife, uh, to offer them her and her children support. This is how I learned more about the details of this case. What was the main scram, you might ask? Fleeing cartel violence in Mexico. This man's contribute to our local economy. He started studies in our schools. The, his wife is a loving mother, and their only crime was attempting to protect their families from being killed like other family members. Instead of receiving his family with protecting arms, like, like my uh, family was a year ago, we flew from Nicaragua, um, uh, allow ICE detain to detain him and separate their family. Is the type of community we want for ourselves? This is the question that we all be thinking about. ICE instills fear in the immigrant community and questions our constitutional rights by ignoring due process. Kids at the elementary level <coughs> are learning that parents are being taken away from their children by authorities. My daughter is six, and several weeks ago, she stood before you to receive a book marijuana from Maria's bookstore. And as innocent she might be, she knows that a father was taken from his daughter. How do we explain this to her? No. This affects us all. Children with counselors. Parents need psychological and economic help. They live in fear. Here I want to quote the wife who the man was detained. She told me, my daughter cries every time she sees a police driving by. Now it's, she's more afraid that she was in Mexico, and I keep intimidating this, intimidating this family. Is the type of community we want? I believe we have a choice. We can cave to eyes and their repressive choice, um, repressive practices, Your time is or we can stand on our civil code. Um, I hope you, you all can stand with me. Thank you very much. We're going to move on, please, to Miss Lynn Morrison. I'm Lynn Morrison, 118 via OST. Children ripped from their parents, or parents separated forcefully from their children, are acts of cruelty, not civility. The notion of public service to our communities is violated when policies of violence, racism, and denial of human rights against our immigrant communities become common practice. Are agents following the ICE standards? Surveillance of residential communities without suspicion of crime is a form of profiling in our community. The narrative of criminal behavior is largely fabricated to pursue these practices of detaining immigrants. Could you recognize an ICE agent in their so-called self-protective garb? They ride our roads wearing black masks, covering their faces, driving into their parking lots with only open slits for their eyes. We object to our taxes being used for intimidation and fear-mongering. Appropriations by lawmakers should steer funding away from ICE towards programs our communities actually need to thrive. Education, housing, health care. We believe it's time to restate to all that Durango does not support hate. We believe hate and masks have no place in our community. We are encouraged that the 6th Judicial DA plans to institute training for law enforcement so that when a crime happens, it can be determined if the crime was committed because of underlying hate or discrimination towards a group. Thank you. My 
name is Kathy Barrett, and I live at 340 Ridge Road. And I'm here to remind you, lest we forget, Fear visited Durango in 1992. Durango had its own test with another organization known for its mask and rose, the Ku Klux Klan. From Fort Lewis College to the Southern Ute Tribe, to the staff, faculty, and students of the college, and to the business community, Durango turned its back on the KKK. The work of this coalition was reflected in one Native American student's argument. Don't listen to the Klan. Don't give them an audience. Send them this message. You're not important. The community joined together in fostering the college's values and protecting the present and future of the people, the community, and the college. In this historical spirit, we propose a Durango City Council re resolution to abolish the use of masks by authorities from ICE and other gov governmental agencies acting in their official capacity. We have seen ICE attired in this and other masks in our community. We have pictures of it. We thought they were charged with securing our communities, not sowing fear and intimidation. We thought law enforcement identified themselves in a public interaction and said where they were from. They don't do that. In the interest of fostering a hate-free town with emphasis on freedom from fear, we want to pride ourselves for civility, not this. I'm Didi Dayato Brown and I live at 3065 East 2nd Avenue in Durango. I'm concerned about the activities of ICE in Durango, not only because of the level of fear and intimidation that they create in the immigrant community and the violation of Durango's civility code, but because of the effect it has on businesses and our economy. We've seen ICE stake out businesses lurking in alleyways as employees try to enter their workplaces. They surprise and arrest workers who have been here for years, who are our friends, family, and loved ones. These are loyal, tax-paying employees who have no criminal records. We've observed ICE racially profile other workers, pull them over, and intimidate them. Businesses in a tourist-driven economy depend heavily on the immigrant workforce. This is a reality. These are skilled, dedicated, and reliable workers. Eye surveillance of local businesses and subsequent arrests creates fear. And employees are oftentimes afraid to come to work. Some have moved away. Businesses scramble to find replacements after their trained and competent workers are hauled away by ICE. A local business owner who pays all of his employees a fair wage and um, benefits told me that ICE activities are disruptive to his business. He even thought of closing one of his businesses if ICE continued their tactics. He said that it definitely affects the morale and state of mind of his staff. Loyal customers of these businesses are often shocked and saddened when they discover their fa favorite worker or even business owner is suddenly gone. I'd also like to address the issue of transparency. In December of last year, Kathy Barrett, who spoke previously, and I made a visit to the unmarked office of ICE at 32 Shepherd Drive in Bodo Park. We spoke to an agent and asked him questions. We asked, how many agents do you have in Durango? He wouldn't tell us. We asked, what are your goals and objectives in Durango? His response was to keep our officers safe. 
We asked for a tour of the facility and that request was denied. We all know that if you go to the Durango Police Department or the Sheriff's Office, they give you this information. Since ICE has this culture of secrecy and won't answer our questions, maybe they would answer to the city of Durango. We request that you engage with them and discuss the following issues and formulate a plan that adheres to our code of civility. ICE's goals and objectives in Durango, the number of agents, the detrimental effect of children in our community, the use of chilling and terrifying garb like masks, the surveillance of the courthouse, schools, businesses, Thank you. and private re residences of U.S. citizens. Thank you. Um, if, if you all agree with what we've said about ICE today, could you um, stand up or applaud? Or for life's everyday tasks. But through the ample amount of consumption that the world has had, we've seen major consequences from this simple convenience. Animals being suffocated by plastic rings, plastic bioaccumulation getting into our food system, and according to multiple sources, entire oceans estimated to contain more <coughs> plastic than fish by the year 2050 are just three examples of why this convenience has affected and will be affecting the world for years to come. We have had the phrase reduce, reuse, and recycle drilled into our heads forever, and I've learned that there is something that comes before reduce, refuse. It is time to refuse plastic bags as a community and be a part of the change to prohibit the detrimental effects. It is our priority and responsibility to be a part of the change to prohibit the detrimental effects of the simple convenience plastic has on our environment and ours and fellow species' lives. Thank you. I'm Hannah Shu, 67 Sun Ridge Lane, and I'm a senior anim at Animus High School. Durango has a large outdoor community with many outdoor athletes and weekend warriors alike. Banning plastic bags is one large way we as a community can make an effort to reform climate change and protect the environment we all know and love. We can also look around the world to see that this change is already happening. 
Other places like Moab, Utah, and Australia already have a ban, so we know it's possible. Durango loves nature, and so do we, and that's the bottom line. Brown Harvey, 95 County Road 205. Hold on just a second. Ms. Phillips, I hope you're getting these names and addresses because they're not on this list. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I have grown up in a world where global warming has, is something that will and always affect me. Uh, it's something that keeps me up at night and something that I worry about all the time. Teenagers have and always will be affected by global warming and same with the generations that are after us. A lot of teenagers that I'll ask will always try and blame global warming on, oh, it's just like generations that came before us, like it's all their fault, you know? But we <laughs> are still using fossil fuels. We're burning um, more than 21 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year, and we're contributing to the GPGP, or Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is now twice the size of Texas. Um, you can, we can't blame anybody for what's happening. What we can do, though, is we can try and make a difference. And that's why I and we are all here today to try and make a difference. Thank you. Maddie Glotfelty, 28 to Delta Lane. Um, in basic, I'm here today for the same reason all of these guys are. We want to see a difference in how Durango in particular is using plastic, and we want to see that difference spread. And I firmly believe that all change starts at a small point, and if that's plastic bags, then we should take that to heart and go with it. Right. Isabel Herringer, 831 Valentine Drive. Louder, Izzy. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, I am speaking on behalf of my generation as well as future generations to come. And I would just like to say that one day I would really like to have kids but I'm not planning on it because if the state of our environment decreases or keeps on going the way that it is, I just don't want to bring another child into this world. Um, so I just think that it would be really important as a community to accept this plastic bag ban at, so I can have, or so we can have generations to come. Yeah. Yes, okay. Kathleen second. Adams, 603 East 9th Street. I was going to say perk up and listen and watch, but uh, no need for that. <laughs> You're perked up, I think. <laughs> um, action speaks louder than words, so I'm glad that you all know, as evidenced by my basement, <clears throat> full of yard sign wires that um, I avoid anything with single use, anything. Therefore, I'm representing supporters, here and beyond, and signers of 1,299 petitions. Um, that was at our last count. Um, and we asked um, one thing tonight, a singular issue, that you place a ban, I'm sorry, that you place this subject matter on your new agenda, um, new business agenda. Our plan tonight was just to take a couple of three-minute slots to talk about timing. So when I'm done, the testimonial for the bands will be done. We can't control freedom of speech, however. <laughs> so we wanted to talk about um, timing and process, not so much rationale. You know the reasons behind it. We've felt listened to by each one of you already. Thank you for that. Your attention to this extremely urgent state of health of our planet is evidenced by development and adoption of the climate action goals which you've recently taken care of for starters we thank you for that critical action as well urgency of diminishing plastics is demonstrated by numerous countries cities and who have uh, 
and states who have plastic bans, 13 already in Colorado with Denver <coughs> recently activated. Urgency is also demonstrated by scientists finding microplastics oozing around and in us. Urgency is also demonstrated by young people who need to be able to act. difference. At the same time, we're aware of your current jam-packed agenda. We know your discussion cannot happen immediately, <clears throat> probably not until spring at the earliest. We know this issue is complex and has a controversial history in Durango. As our elected uh, representatives, your wisdom about the timing and the means of the ordinance development is paramount. We know this paradigm shift from autonomy to benevolent regulation takes time, education, and especially wisdom. We ask for the unity of mission to move from a culture of convenience and waste onto continuing toward Durango beyond plastics. Now, before the clock runs out, I'll stop so none of you need to turn your back on me. <laughs> Thank you. That's an inside joke. <laughs> Tom Berry, please. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Oh, that was that's democracy. That's right. Uh, hello, my, my name is Tom Berry. I live at 786 Animus View Drive in Durango. Um, I apologize for writing this down and reading it to you, but I wanted to keep it within my three minutes. Um, I'm here to represent the Elkton Townhomes on Animus View Drive. Uh, I serve as the president of the uh, Elkton Homeowners Association, probably because I put my hand up. Uh, I've lived on Animus View Drive for over nine years. And we have a serious and dangerous situation with the street use, specifically the speed limit of 35 miles an hour. <clears throat> if you compare Animus View Drive with 32nd Street, you'll see that while we enjoy a speed limit, well, they enjoy a speed limit of 25 miles an hour, our speed limit is 10 miles an hour higher, meaning the actual traffic is going much faster. Along Animus View Drive, we do not have sidewalks, we do not have road shoulders, a bike lane, or a turning lane like they do on 32nd Street. We do have many blind corners on Animus U Drive as it snakes along in two lanes that have been there for a long time. On Animus U Drive, we have auto, foot, bicycle, dogs, pedestrian traffic with a high concentration of dwelling units consisting of at least 34 houses, 14 apartments, 204 townhouse and condominiums, and 100 plus dwelling units at the mobile home park on the south end of Animus U Drive. In addition, there is an RV park uh, with an advertised 100 plus sites with water and electricity and 90 10 sites at the north end. This far exceeds the dwelling units or traffic orientation of 32nd Street. As Oxbow River, as the Oxbow River put in, gets into uh, operation, traffic will only increase. We respectfully request that the speed limit on Animus View Drive be addressed with a reduction to 25 miles an hour. The City Council has, in the past, approved one such re reduction to 25 miles an hour, as far as I know, on 32nd Street. And that was over staff objections. We have requested of city staff a speed reduction, starting first with the police department, then on to the city of Durango, and were basically turned down and told that it probably would not happen. We know that a lower speed limit won't be popular, but neither will vehicle pedestrian and vehicle bike coll collisions that are bound to happen. Consider that Animus U Drive has the same speed as North Main Avenue. Further, we respectfully request that the police presence be stepped up on Animus U Drive to enforce the new speed limit. As well, the north end and south end 
uh, I'm sorry, the north and southbound red light at the intersection of Animus, Animus View Drive and Highway 550 is routinely run. I have, and I've witnessed this week, or this last week, a multi-unit tank truck running Thank a you, totally Mr. red light wrap up, please. and uh, uh, not even slowing down. And this happens on a weekly basis. Thanks for your attention and we hope that uh, we can reduce the speed limit on Animus View Drive. Thank you. Oh, sorry, it's, it's Durango High School first. Oh, yes, it's <laughs> Hi, I'm Jade Pruitt speaking on behalf of Durango High School, 2390 Main Avenue. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Community Ambassador on Durango High School Student Council, and I give monthly reports to the City Council about what DHS Student Council is doing. So this month, DHS Student Council held a rake and run on November 2nd. Over 30 students helped to rake community members' yards for free. The Native American Club hosted the Pow Wow Slash Craft Fair on the 16th, and we saw a large community turnout, so thank you. On November 8th, DHS held a Veterans Day Assembly, um, where we hosted over 40 community veterans, and we honored their service and sacrifice. Also, 505 students will be taking AP exams this year from DHS. This is a great increase from last year where we had 428 students. DHS student leadership and Fort Lewis College student leadership um, are meeting to discuss how each other's organizations function and what common interests and issues they have. Most fall sports have ended at DHS and we are excited to start the winter sports season. That being said, we're excited to send off football, who has made it to the second round of state playoffs and will be playing Pueblo County this Saturday. Lastly, this is the last weekend of Troop 1096's production of The Little Mermaid. So buy your tickets online. It is Thursday and Friday at 7 p.m. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Sweetie Marbury and I live at 2256 West 2nd Avenue. I, I came tonight to talk about two things. First, I want to thank Mayor Youssef, Councilor Bettine, and Councilor Brookie for your support in protecting the pedestrians by funding the long plan for bridges at 32nd Street and to finish the Animus River Trail North. Thank you for listening to the Parks and Rec Board and the Multimodal Board for their recommendation in funding the bridges on 32nd Street. I want to thank you for listening to Superintendent Dan Snowberger and the Riverview Elementary PTO and the Needham Elementary PTO in asking for protection for children and pedestrians for, by funding the bridges at 32nd Street. We are at the finish line of the Animus River Trail North after a decade of meetings and planning. It is the right thing to do to protect pedestrians from inter interaction with cars. This will be your legacy long after you are gone from City Council. I'm very, very proud of your support and I look forward to the future and riding and walking across those bridges for pedestrian safety. Second, I came to talk about the City Council of 2012. I was on that 2012 City Council when we banned plastic bags. I certainly support the banning of plastic bags from Durango. I know Kroger's has put a timeline of 2025, but Durango is a, a vi vibrant city and you saw the support from the people here and it really made my heart soar with energy to think that Durango will be joining numerous states and cities across the United States in Europe and Hawaii in the banning of plastic bags. I look forward to future city council action. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Sally Smith. I live at 342 Confluence Avenue in Three Springs. I was here last month with uh, seven other people who are really trying to keep at the forefront of you guys' minds like you don't have enough to keep on your minds already, uh, the ice arena, the full-time ice arena for Durango. Um, I am a figure skating coach for U.S. Figure Skating. I am flown all over the country and I do seminars and conduct camps for athlete, ice athletes as well as their parents. 
Uh, we've, we've made some progress since last month, and I just wanted you to know that because I know you're looking at that master plan. Uh, we had seven of us here last month. Today, between all of this, we still have about 25 of us here, and we've now got a database that's uh, 140 people of emails that we're communicating with, and that that's growing by one or two every day. So there's a huge passion for having full-time ice in, in Durango. I, I'm a little confused why we don't. Uh, I came from Denver and we have more adult hockey players here than we had at my three ice surface rink in Denver. We have such an amazing parks and recreation department here and we offer so many wonderful programs for so many uh, of our community members and I just think it's time for the ice athletes to get a chance to train full time too and, and have a full time rink and we would love to see that happen. I know that every year the parks and rec department does a, a survey of uh, residents of the town of Durango and they have on that all their priorities and I know the ice arena is really low on that list. However, through our database that we're now gathering, this grassroots effort, we're finding that so many people that are really passionate about this ice arena um, live outside the city limits. And I know that's a problem because they don't pay taxes for these programs, but you can surcharge them. I paid a surcharge for 14 years for my kid to skate at South Suburban because I lived outside of the Parks and Rec District. And I don't see a problem with that, and I don't think our people do either. I think we now have to factor in the outlying areas. I guess it's the sentiment of if you build it, they will come. And I do believe if you build it, they will come. They will come from Edgemont Ranch. They will come from Twin Buttes. They will come from Bayfield. They'll come from uh, Mancos and Hermosa. And from all the outlying areas, this is a big program we've got. And we now got some teaching professionals at the rink here that are really highly trained and are going to be able to make this a successful program. So, on a very short notice, we got 30 here. Last month, we had seven. We got 140 waiting for an email. And if you build it, they will come. They will most definitely come. Thank you. Not as important as plastic bags, but it's important. Uh, Janet Wiley, uh, 312 Fiesta Circle, Durango, Colorado. Um, I want to thank you again for be having the opportunity um, to thank you for the support on the bridge for 32nd Street that not only crosses the 32nd Street, but also the railroad tracks and the river, making it a, a safe um, crossing. Um, I'm a li lifelong resident and an engaged participant in the Animus uh, River Trail. Um, and I know we've been up here before, we've, you've heard all of the uh, proponents' um, comments on um, you know, the support for the multimodal board and um, the GOCO funding and all this. But from the last time I've spoke in front of you, I did a little bit of research. And I read what makes a bike uh, bikeable community. I did a little research on that. And there's multiple um, publications that do these sorts of surveys. Uh, Bicycling Magazine, People for Bikes, the League of American Cyclists, and NACDO, which is a National Association of City Transportation Officials. These publications gather data from publicly available uh, databases from government sources and new data from online communities, city snapshots, and, and public forums. The influences of a bikeable community survey include ridership, networks, friendliness, but the number one um, factor in all of these surveys comes back to safety. In Bicycle Magazine, 50 best cities surveyed, completed in 19, um, I'm sorry, 2018. They listed 50 cities in America. They usually uh, reserve though that list for metropolitan areas, recognizing the difficulty in introducing bike, biking infrastructure in a large metropolitan area. However, in this 2018 survey, number three was Fort Collins, Colorado. They couldn't leave that one out of their survey because Fort Collins is doing so much right to create a bikeable community. Um, directly out of that survey, 
What makes Fort Collins so great is that this city has focused its building pathways to move cyclists through town quickly and efficiently. They are purposefully building pathways un with under and over passes and at nearly every street crossing. You rarely have to interface with cars. In fact, there are currently 45 of these grade crossings, either underpasses or bridges. 45. Thanks, Bill in Riley. Can you wrap that's up? time. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to say it's a it's a beautiful concept. It's a it's a decade long vision, and you'll, it will be one that you'll be proud of as a council. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Okay. I was calling for Mr. Jacob Fillion. Uh, maybe he didn't hear. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'll give you another opportunity. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Jacob Fillion. I live at 191 Riverview Drive here in Durango. I'm here to ask the City Council to approve the draft 2019 Durango Parks Open Space Trails and Recreation Master Plan. Individually, as a resident and taxpayer of the city, I use many of the parks and recreation facilities and amenities, from walking or biking the Animus River Trail to working out and playing pickleball at the rec center. So I have an interest in seeing this plan passed. But I am here today as the president of the Southwest Colorado Pickleball Association and I represent our 145 paying members. Our request is to approve the 2019 plan. The 2010 master plan is out of date. <clears throat> our mission is to promote and grow the sport of pickleball. You are probably aware that pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the country. Courts and tournaments are popping up all across the nation. Most of the cities and towns on the western slope currently have outdoor pickleball courts. Recently, 26 Durango residents traveled to Indian Wells, California, six of us to participate in the USA National Pickleball Championships, the others to cheer us on. Pickleball is truly a community-oriented sport. In Durango, we have players who range in age from high school teenagers to one member who is 88 years old. Men and women, young and old, compete together. We have one family that at times, the grandfather who just turned 85, plays on the same court with his son and grandson, oftentimes beating them. We have a member who suffered from severe depression. Pickleball has helped her overcome her depression to where she is now functions more fully in society and was recently hired by Parks and Rec as a lifeguard at the rec center. In September, we co-hosted a pickleball tournament with Durango High School. 90 participants competed over two days. They came from the Four Corners area, California, Arizona, New Mexico. The tournament had two objectives, to demonstrate the viability and popularity of outdoor pickleball in Durango, and as a fundraiser for the Durango High School athletic and activities programs. We raised $1,500 for Durango High School that and the number of players and distances traveled clearly demonstrates that we achieved both of our objectives. I am here to ask you to approve the master plan. We would like to have dedicated outdoor pickleball courts built in Durango. The construction of courts is in the draft master plan. There is no mention of pickleball in the 2010 master plan. People didn't play pickleball in Durango at that time. We want to raise money through grants and donations to build outdoor pickleball courts. To do so, we need a current parks and recreation <clears throat> master plan that addresses and demonstrates city support. As a citizen of Durango, I support many of the proposed elements of the draft master plan. Durango Mesa Park, Animus River Trail, and Three Springs Thank Community you. Park. Time is up. Okay. Thank you. I just think that. Thank you. Thank you. John Simpson, please. And then Mary will have you. 
Mayor Yusuf, John Simpson, 1831 Crestview Drive. Budget discussions this year have unfortunately gravitated into an unnecessary complex discussion of the definition of capital projects and maintenance projects and the intricacies of transferring money from one fund to the other fund. Staff has succeeded in diverting the attention of the minutia of budgeting instead of allowing council to focus on the basic policies that should guide budget preparation. It is now apparent that the three of you are prepared to allow continuation of the flawed uh, system implemented by the prior city manager. The instructions that should have been given to staff is one, the 2019 sales tax should be 100% addition to the streets, to what was already spent on the streets. Two, capital carryover should not, capital, carrying capital projects not in progress at the end of the year should cease. Only projects specifically approved by council should be allowed in 2020. And three, determining the compensation of city employees should be determined by comparing what non-city employees in Durango earn, not what people in Boulder earn. Kim and Barbara have explained the structural problem you're creating. I want to explain the loss of public trust that is occurring. At the Infrastructure Advisory Committee, discussion occurred on what, whether to treat the 2019 revenue as an addition to what has been spent and budgeted with the 2019 tax for streets. I'm sorry. One member quickly said, I'm pretty sure that that's the way I thought the vote was. And I'm sure I believe most people thought that's the case that you weren't going to take this money and put it away somewhere else. It's likely that advisory member read an information sent to every single voter that said, yes, there's money in the general fund, but not enough. Most people expected the general fund to continue to support streets. Later in the infrastructure meeting, the 2019 tax shuffle was explained, and the question was, well, where does the magic two million come from in 10 years when this goes away? That question was not answered. Furthermore, the vocal proponent of the improvements to Thomas Avenue, a gentleman said, I think the public's perception is that it was really to help beat up sidewalks and beat up streets. They thought, this, they thought the same thing I did possibly, that this 1A was to help get the sidewalks and streets straightened out because the operating expense now is from the general fund. The public thought that the general fund would support the streets and gave you their vote. <clears throat> Unless I remember when we spoke to when I, my letter to the editor went out. Just because Rod is gone doesn't make this plan any less shady. Keep this simple. Minimize transfers from the temporary dedicated sales taxes to the general fund. The problem of losing the public trust is not easily fixed. Half the city has already had enough. Now you're losing the trust of the people who voted yes on 1A. Violating what the people thought they were voting for is inexcusable. Mr. Simpson, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Oswald. My name is Mary Oswald and I live at 585 East 31st Street um, in Durango. And I'm here to urge the entire council to support the pedestrian bridge um, at 32nd Street. I live practically in um, view of where this bridge would be. My next door neighbor's daughter was uh, hit and almost killed at that in intersection 25 years ago and it has completely messed up their lives. Um, and I want you to know that our entire neighborhood is behind this effort and the big question that all our neighbors ask is if this is funded by GOCO and the GOCO funds are there, why aren't we supporting it? Thank you. Thank you. If there's anyone else that would like to join us in public participation who's here tonight. Okay, with that then, we are going to move on to our next agenda item. If you could pass this up just those for me, please. That is agenda item number five. Um, and we are going to start with the presentation for city operations. Uh, 
Madam Mayor, uh, Levi Lloyd, Director of City Operations. Uh, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of uh, who City Operations are and what we do. Um, so City Operations uh, Division is comprised of 42 committed civic employees and nine distinct divisions. We have the Streets Department, which is uh, comprised of street maintenance, snow and ice, street cleaning. Uh, we have Fleet Facilities and Warehouse, the Risk Manager and Loss Control, and then Sustainable Services, which is Trash Recycling, uh, Recycling Center, and the Sustainability Coordinator. So the Streets Division is uh, 15 staff members responsible for maintenance and operation of 83 centerline miles of road. Um, this represents uh, over a million and a half square yards of asphalt surface and approximately $90, 90 million dollar asset value. Um, in street maintenance, uh, in 2018, we completed 841 work orders. Uh, in 20, uh, 2019, year to date, we have completed 554 work orders. That number uh, will probably top 1,000 at the end of the year. Um, in 2018, we patched 990 potholes uh, after a pretty significant winter. Well, you can see that number went up significantly. We've patched, uh, year to date, we've patched uh, about 1,900 potholes, um, and that's an estimate of what, where we will finish up. Uh, the Snow and Ice Division, uh, last year we spent 3,800 3, hours uh, plowing snow and we removed 27,000 cubic yards of snow from the downtown business district and uh, residential streets. Uh, street cleaning, uh, we swept uh, about 13,000 miles in 2019 and removed 4,000 cubic yards of debris. If you can imagine um, that just remaining on the streets, that's uh, 400 truckloads of material that is just out in the streets. This is leaves, sanding material, and other dirt and debris that is in the streets. So, um, pretty big effort to keep the city clean. Uh, so, fleet facilities and warehouse. Uh, this is 15 employees comprised of uh, custodians, mechanics, shop foremen, uh, and warehouse staff. Uh, we maintain. 305 pieces of equipment. Uh, we completed 2,033 work orders in 2018, and just short of uh, 2,000 work orders year to date in 2019, and we are estimating that that uh, number is probably gonna be, uh, in the last two months, we'll have a lot more DIs come in, so that number's probably gonna top 2,200 work orders uh, in 2019. Um, we maintain seven general fund buildings um, that represent 77,000 square feet of improved facilities and almost 10 acres of property that we're responsible for the maintenance and upkeep on. Uh, and our warehouse maintains and tracks 25,000 pieces of in inventory and that represents uh, $375,000 asset value. This is all the things that we need to maintain the equipment, um, toilet paper for the bathrooms and printer paper. So it all comes through there. Uh, and then the warehouse, uh, last in the warehouse, uh, we process um, approximately 1,500 pieces of freight each year. This is uh, small boxes like this from Amazon to huge truckloads of um, paint and other um, materials and supplies that we use for all the things that the city does uh, day to day. So risk manager and loss prevention um, in 2018 uh, conducted 174 job site and safety inspections. Um, that number is up slightly in uh, 2019. Uh, we've done 184 job site and safety inspections. In 2018, we processed 50 property or work and workers' compensation claims. Uh, that number is up. Typically, we will see a bump in numbers after big winters. Um, it's slick out there, and almost all of those increases are vehicle um, vehicle on vehicle crime, unfortunately. Uh, but we processed 66 uh, property and workers' compensation claims in 2019. Sustainability, sustainable services, uh, this is 11 staff members, um, uh, manager, uh, administrator, and uh, equipment operators. Um, this is a big one. We were just awarded the 2018 uh, EcoCycle Gold Medal for Best Recycling Program outside the Front Range. This is a huge deal. We have, we were recognized as having the best diversion rates of any uh, rural uh, recycling program. And this is, um, this is not just the city of Durango's staff. Um, this is a compilation of all the recycling that happens, so all the other um, partners out there. 
Um, but I will toot my staff's horn and say that a good portion of that comes from us. We, we divert a lot of material. We have a very robust recycling program. So, um, But you can see uh, we service uh, just over 5,000 residential trash and recycling customers. We have 560 commercial trash and recycling customers. We offer service six days a week. Um, Monday through Saturday. Uh, we work holidays, we work in snowstorms. Um, we haul an average of uh, approximately 10,000 tons of trash each year, but we divert and process an average of uh, almost 4,000 tons of recycling material. That's a five-year average, and in the last two years, we've been over 4,000 uh, tons of recycled material. So um, this is just a quick snapshot of what City Operations does. This is does not include uh, utilities. I'll be back to talk about utilities, but I didn't want to take up too much of your time. So uh, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. No, thank you. And if you could, uh, as always, share that presentation. That's great information. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. OK, moving on to Parks and Recreation, please. Ms. Metz. So good evening, Madam, Madam Mayor and members of City Council. I'm here to talk to you about the Durango Parks and Recreation Department, Kathy Metz, Parks and Recreation Director, and I'd like to share with you how we enrich lives every day. So first talk about a little bit before we get into some of the details is what are the benefits of Parks and Recreation in Durango and what do we do for the community? We create healthy lifestyles, we preserve and conserve environmental resources, foster economic vitality and build community that enhances our quality of life and really the reason why people want to live here. In administration of Parks and Recreation in Durango, we have 38 full-time employees and over 500 part-time and seasonal employees and we serve a documented number of 545,000 participants every year. So this does not include the number of people that just drop in and visit our parks or use our trails. These are people that actually come and we can document their paid service for our services that we provide. We received national accreditation in 2015 from the national accreditation by the Commission for Accreditation of Parks and Recreation Agencies and we've maintained that since that time. It's a market distinction that recognizes commitment to the highest level of service to the community. We also received the National Gold Medal Award, which is the highest agency award acknowledged by the National Recreation and Park Association. One agency in the entire United States is selected annually by population, and we are in a classification that is for 30,000 or less. It demonstrates the excellence in parks and recreation management by the department. In parks, we have quality management and maintenance of parks, open space, and trails. We have over 300 acres of developed parks in Durango. We also manage the 8.4 miles of the Animas River in town and over 41 miles of road right of way. In the forestry area in the Parks Division, we are Tree City USA, and we've had that designation from the National Arbor Day Foundation for 39 consecutive years. We maintain over 10,000 trees in the parks and along the street right-of-way, and we have a community forest management plan that guides us on the expansion of the urban forest, as well as tells us about the value of our trees. In terms of the people that came earlier today about the importance of the environment, I think that's really important to our community. Um, in terms of the carbon sequestration and the shade that trees provide, and you all know the benefits of trees in our community. We have a cemetery at Greenmount Cemetery, and we provide um, end-of-life services for members of our community. It's about a 40-acre facility, and we also have the historic Anima City Cemetery that's no longer uh, receiving burials at the current time, but has a lot of interesting history at that location. Lake Nighthorse is a regional destination of just under 2,000 acres, and of that, about 1,500 acres is water. And all of our capital improvements at Lake Nighthorse is very um, done very carefully in terms of our capital and operations to minimize the disturbance to natural and cultural resources on site. 
We had a rec an economic impact study of the recreational use at Lake Night Horse, and at full build out, the visitation is expected to generate just under $8 million annually in Durango and 12 million, over $12 million in the local economic input output of, of La Plata County. We have over 3,000 acres of open space in Durango, and we provide responsible stewardship of that natural resource. We like to promote the conservation values, which includes the view shed protection, ecological stability, wildlife habitat, and recreation. We have um, about 15 miles of hard surface trails and over 96 miles of natural surface trails, and we know that over 90% of Durango residents use our city trails annually. In the community events area, we provide quality services to um, primarily nonprofit organizations that like to provide community events. More recently is a picture of the Veterans Day Parade, which is on Main Street, and upcoming is Snowdown. So these are the type of events. Um, there's over 225 of them each year that we make sure that we can work with those event organizers to make sure there's a minimal disruption of city services. And we also promote tourism and activities that draw people downtown, um, as well as we um, organize and, and put together the 4th of July celebration for the community. In recreation, we provide community recreation services for over 450,000 participants each year. And we pr provide fiscal sustainability by achieving the 90% cost recovery goal. We promote health and wellness, as well as social connectivity in our community. The Durango Community Recreation Center is an, a 71,500 square foot facility. It's a full service recreation center, and it serves now over 1,300 participants a day. The Durango Gymnastics Facility is just under 12,000 square feet, and gymnastics provides an interesting combination of ability to learn balance and life skills so you have courage to maybe venture where you might not be able to go otherwise. The program provides uh, abilities for very young toddlers all the way up to adults and serves over 8,200 participants annually. Chapman Hill is a 38-acre facility that includes an in-town ski hill, a 33,600 square foot ice rink and pavilion, and serves just under 21,000 participants annually. Recreation programs are a broad range from infants to seniors, and we provide over 300 unique programs annually to members of our community. And that's just a snapshot of Durango Parks and Recreation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Anything from council? Thanks for the information, it's very interesting. Okay, moving on to review of the consent agenda. Can you please read those for us, Ms. Phillips? You bet. <laughs> so items 6.1 through 6.6 .6 are approval of minutes for August and November of 2019. 6.1 is the special study session, August 14th. 6.2, the special study session, August 21. 6.3, special study session, August 28. 6.4, the special meeting, November 5. 6.5, special study session, November 5th, and 6.6, .6, the regular meeting of November 5th. Items 6.7 and 6.8 are discussion and possible action items. 6.7 concerns resolution R-2019-45, adopting the performance evaluation process for the city manager. 6.8 concerns the submission of an energy impact assistant fund grant application to support an energy performance contract. Item 6.9 is a request for public hearing with a proposed date of December 3rd, 2019 to consider the granting of an easement to Roger and Patricia Singer to install underground electric communications and gas services at 1074 East 5th Avenue. Items 6.10 through 6.14 are final approval of ordinances. 6.10 is Ordinance 0 2019 21 repealing and reenacting Chapter 3 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango related to alcoholic beverages and declaring an effective date. 6.11 is Ordinance 0 2019 22 amending Chapter 27 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango, the Land Use and Development Code 
by the amendment of sections, tables, definitions, and by amending chapter six, commercial design guide, and chapter nine, downtown overlay, district design guidelines of the said land use and development code as set forth herein and declaring effective date. 6.12 is ordinance 02019-23 amending chapter eight of the code of ordinances of the city of durango by the addition of a fire impact fee to be imposed on development requiring a city building permit and <coughs> an effective date 6.13 ordinance 0 2019-24 amending section 25-114 of chapter 25 of the code of ordinances of the city of the durango purposes of modifying sewer rates for residential, commercial, and industrial users of the wastewater system and clarifying the categories of users and declaring an effective date. And item 6.14 is ordinance 0 2019 amending portions of section 25-30 of chapter 25 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango for purposes amending the, the rates for outside city users and clarifying rates for irrigation accounts and declaring an effective date. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any counselors that would like to remove an item from the consent agenda this evening? Uh, Mayor, Madam Mayor, can I just bring a point up? Um, on the materials that were distributed on Tuesday, there was an item on the consent agenda that discussed the Santa Rita Park and a possible appropriation from that, and I had asked that that be removed from the consent agenda, but I do not see it on this agenda. That item has been removed from the agenda and is going back to the Infrastructure Advisory Board for discussion based on a conversation and recommendation that was brought, that the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board brought forward. Um, so instead of bringing it to council numerous times, staff pulled it from the agenda so we can bring you all the information at once. Okay. Would anyone like to remove an item from the agenda? Excellent. I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Ms. Phillips, may we have a roll call, please? Councillor Bettine? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Brickey? Yes. Councillor Baxter? Yes. Councillor Noseworthy? Yes. Mayor Yeesa? Yes. All right, moving on then to public hearings. We have one quasi-judicial hearing tonight. This is an opportunity for citizens to provide formal input into our decision-making process. The format is intentionally organized to ensure fairness and transparency for all parties involved. This does require a legal process in which facts and opinions are presented to council who serve as unbiased decision-makers. The applicant has the burden of proof in these hearings. We welcome all public testimony. We ask that it be limited to three minutes. City staff will present the staff report. We will then open the public hearing, have a presentation by the applicant or developer. We'll have public testimony um, and then questions from council um, and response from city staff. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and council members. This is for a preliminary plat re um, review for 30th at Main, 2977 Main Avenue. Um, sorry, the map's a little fuzzy, but I use this map because it is 2019 um, map. This is currently a building that is under construction. There were two buildings there that have been demolished, and this building is now being constructed as a mis mixed use project. Um, it is in the mixed use arterial zone district. It does abut the um, existing neighborhood two zone district. So it's right there on the corner of 30th and Main. So these are the existing conditions. This is what is proposed um, and it is currently under the construction. They're hoping that will be all dried in by um, January and then they'll start some of the tenant finishes. The Zia, as you can see right there from the proposed sign, Zia will be in here as well as a bar upstairs. There will also be an optometrist and a dentist as well. So those three uses are the ones that are being um, proposed. So the preliminary plat is to divide these into three condos so that these can be sold off individually. So the optometrist will own theirs and the dentist theirs and then Zia theirs. So this is a preliminary plat for that proposal. It is reviewed according to the Land Use and Development Code 6-3-6. Um, staff has found that it does meet this. It is not residential. Um, and it, um, 
So, and it is a conforming structure because it is under construction and has received all the building permits. Um, the structure does comply with all plumbing, electrical, and fire codes, and there will be master water meters um, installed for each building cluster, so for those three separate units. Um, as mentioned, staff does recommend approval of the 30th at Main Commercial Condominium Preliminary Condominium Plat. With the finding that the commercial condominium plat meets the evaluation criteria of the Land Use and Development Code and is subject to the following conditions. One, to include all plat language, plat notes, and easement dedications determined appropriate by city staff on the final plat. All written, verbal, and graphic representations of the applicant shall be deemed conditions of approval, and all comments provided by city staff shall be addressed prior to recordation of the condominium plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any public hearing? Any, any, I, I, don't, I can't see, but I don't think there's anyone to speak. I think we're good. Okay. Do we have a presentation from the applicant or developer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, you can always come back at the end if we have questions. All right, so um, no public testimony. Questions from council? Well, shall I make a motion? Well, maybe at least tell me about the public park. <laughs> the public park? Yes. Um, yes, so there is yes. a park. You can sort of see it yep. here along the south edge. Um, so there is a park that is being proposed there. Uh, the design of it is being funded by the Durango Creates grant um, for that design. So it is going to be a public-private kind of partnership to allow some of the events, maybe the Animus Night Bazaar will go there, maybe other such events, but yeah, to really create an interaction with the public realm um, and the private. That was something that was very important to the developers, mm -hmm. especially along North Main. Really excited about it. Any other questions? Okay, then I will entertain a motion. <coughs> I move to recommend approval of the proposed preliminary <coughs> condominium plat, creating the potential for separate condominium ownership interests in the three commercial units in the building located at 2977 Main Avenue, with the finding that the proposal complies with the City of Durango Land Use and Development Code per presented testimony, submitted documentation, and conditions outlined in the staff report. Second. Any further discussion? Ms. Phillips? Mayor Pro Tim Brookie? Yes. Councillor Baxter? Yes. Councillor Bettine? Yes. Councillor Noseworthy? Yes. Mayor Yusuf? Yes. Excellent. Okay, moving on to item number 11.1 discussion and possible action concerning the award of contract to successful executive search firm. Dur yeah, this item flows from Council's uh, activity last Tuesday in conducting interviews. Uh, the Council, I understand, uh, reduce the number of applicants down to two. So, and council requested that this item be put on the agenda tonight for action or at least potential action. So uh, that's the background on that. So it's up to council to take action at this point if you desire to do so. Um, Mayor, I had a, just one note I wanted to address sure. to the council. Um, due to my travel schedule, as you all know, I was not able to attend the session where you, you uh, narrowed this down to two candidates. And as such, my plan this evening is to uh, is to try and stay out of the vote if I can. I imagine you can reach consensus. I'll listen to your discussion. If for some reason a vote is needed to move forward on the issue and you're tied two to two, I may consider voting just so we can continue to move forward with the process. But um, uh, otherwise, I'll probably remain silent on this issue. Great, thank you. Is that okay with you, Dirk? It's your call. It's your call. All right, great. Thank you, Councilor Bettine. Discussion, motion from Council. Um, thoughts? I'd like to share some thoughts first, and then I'm willing to entertain a motion, but I, if anybody else wants to add thoughts first. First of all, I thought it was a robust process, and I thought the, uh, for the public, we had 14 applicants. We went through reviewing them all, and then a rating system uh, that we uh, pursued, and then from those looked at four uh, interviewed, had at least half hour interviews with each of those consulting firms, um, and tried to have those via video conference. So, right, and then um, and then from there, we narrowed it down to two and had the HR department um, uh, contact their references. 
so I think that just for the public to know that process. I was um, very pleased with the two finalists. I do believe that when I re went back and reread the information and I looked at issues, I have a stronger leaning towards Slavin. And if we need to go in that discussion, I'm happy to provide my rationale for that. Any other comments? <coughs> I do I accept to say that it was a great process. And so thank you to HR and also to um, finance for making it all happen. You know, each of us has invested probably eight to 10 to 12 hours of time to select the headhunter, which will ultimately bring us candidates for the city manager position. So I look forward to those discussions and the time involved in uh, making the correct and appropriate decision for that person to, to take leadership role in our city. Uh, either of these candidates uh, are in the business to do this for us and take us through this, uh, shepherd us through this process. And I think uh, uh, we, it, neither of them is a mistake mm -hmm. uh, out of the, all the 14 that were that submitted. Uh, these are top tier candidates. So uh, the other being Peckham and Marshall. McKinney. McKinney, McKinney. McKinney. thank you. Uh, and Peckham and McKinney. And I'd like to hear the thoughts uh, with the distinguished year elevation of Slavin to the uh, above mm -hmm. Peckham sure. and McKinney. So should, can I make a mo uh, motion? Sure, um, before you do, i just give you a little bit of information that I did receive uh, up at CML um, at the mayor summit. Um, I did get some direct feedback from the current mayor of Aspen, who um, they used the second firm, Peckham and McKinney, and they were actually not successful in finding um, a, a city manager in their search. Uh, for a number of reasons that he went into, um, and he, um, but it was it was it was useful information for me to ha uh, talk to him about that process and what it looked like for them. He was definitely disappointed um, in in the fact that they went through the entire process and, and were not ultimately successful. Um, and so uh, that was just in some interest. I thought I would share that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think uh, both candidates were very strong, and I would. Slavins as well. I think that I could work with them, and and, and with either, either with really with either of them. I think that um, a lot of it has to do with our the work that we're about to engage in together. <coughs> so I, I I don't have exact wording, but I would like to make a motion. There was a motion on the I'd like to make a motion. Where is it? On? Okay. I'd, I'd like to just comment that that's excellent input and uh, yeah. very correct. Thank asking. you very much. Uh, that's a really good update. So thank you. So it is recommended that council take action by motion to select Slavin and Associates, I believe it's called, to act as the executive search firm to assist the city council in recruiting a city manager, and that staff be authorized to issue a notice of award and to negotiate a contract with that firm on the terms set forth in their proposal, subject to additional terms and conditions discussed in this meeting, and that the mayor may be authorized to sign that contract on behalf of the city council. We have a second. I'll second. Discussion? Sure, yeah, I'd like to just explain why I, I, with two good candidates, one rose for me above the other. First of all, and I do a little bit of contrast and comparison for me, Slavin has 850 placements, many of them um, county and city experience. They seek community input from the start and they seek council guidance throughout the process. At the, after 30 days of a placement, they meet with the city manager um, to discuss goals and levels and kind of how that's going. And every one of their searches has resulted in selection. They have uh, Colorado references and they provide a two-year guarantee on their services. They also interview their candidates in the work setting, which I think is really interested. And they do their background checks early in the process and uh, their fees was about uh, 24575 Peckham and McKinney have done about 200 city manager re uh, recruitments. They do have Colorado experience. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, Slavin has about a 95% success ratio of staying five years or longer. Uh, Peckham and McKenzie, 89. Um, they're pro, uh, in the uh, Peckham and McKenzie, they do their background check 
Later in the process, though, for an extra fee, we could do that. They have a one-year guarantee, and um, they were involved in the, originally they rose in my uh, estimate because they were involved in the Aspen city manager search. The other thing I didn't add is that with Slavin, we would have three people working with us. And with uh, Peckham's McKinney, there would be only one. And that concerns me, should one person get ill, that one person get ill, have something come up, I think that I would, uh, you know, and I, you know, we have the assurance that the principal of Slavin is involved, but there's also uh, support around that. So that's my rationale. Any other comments? Discussion? Ms. Phillips? Councillor Baxter? Yes. Councillor Bettine? Uh, abstain. Councillor Noseworthy? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Brookie? Yes. And Mayor Yusef? Yes. Introduction of ordinances, Mr. Nelson. Yes, this is ordinance uh, 2019 26. It's a uh, Ordinance appropriating sums of money uh, to the various funds and spending agencies and the amounts and for the purposes set forth below for the city of Durango, Colorado for the 2020 budget year. As we discussed during the study session prior to this meeting, it's necessary for the city to adopt uh, this ordinance in final form before we can uh, uh, approve the mill levy. That's due on the 15th of December. So first reading tonight would allow uh, for the second reading on the 3rd of December and allow for the approval of the mill levy um, also on the 3rd of December. I, it, I, I will point out that I think that uh, Mayor, uh, uh, Council Noseworthy said that it didn't show up on her uh, iPad, but the ordinance was actually loaded yesterday. So I hope all of you saw that and have it. Uh, I have so it on know, my computer. Derek, it, it wasn't loading earlier. We all were having the same problem. Okay. It's theoretically been fixed since then. Yeah, I can right. load it. Yeah. Okay, well, I, it did come up on my, yeah. on my machine. Yeah. Um, so to the extent that we need to go make copies of it, if we need to, we can go do that. Did every, does everyone have that? Okay. Yeah. We I want to see copies. Me. Okay, well, maybe sure. we need to. There you go. Right there. Could you okay. also address the, I'm, I'm good. the I'm language good, that we talked about adding as a result of the uh, prior study session? Yes. Uh, one of the things that was discussed at the study session was the potential need to make changes uh, or fine tune the numbers that are shown in this ordinance between first reading and second reading. Although it doesn't uh, happen very often, the process does contemplate that there can be amendments in an ordinance but between first reading and second reading. So that um, opportunity would avail itself uh, if uh, additional, uh, again, fine tuning is uh, done to these numbers prior to the December 3rd meeting for second reading. And if someone wants to include that in a motion, that would be fine. Um, I do recommend, staff recommends that due to the time frames involved, uh, that council approve this ordinance uh, 0-2019-26 on first reading tonight. And again, we can make copies if you want to do that. Or I can read the numbers even. We have, I have it. Okay. I think we have it. Do we have a motion? I would make a motion to approve ordinance number 2019-26, 0-2019-26, with the amended language that Dirk just mentioned. I would second that motion. Further council discussion? Ms. Phillips, may we have a roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Brookie? Yes. Councillor Bettine? Yes. Councillor Baxter? No. Councillor Noseworthy? No. Mayor Yusuf? Yes. Moving on to interim city manager report, city status update. Amber Blake. Yes. Um, so I have a financial report this evening for the September financial report. Um, and then I just wanted to let you know that I will have the October financial report. We're looking at December 3rd for that and November on December 17th. I'm sorry, what? Nothing. This is September. That's where we're at. We haven't done September. So I have that for you. And then we also have the third quarter. Um, I have the third quarter CIP report as well. And we'll as always remind you to love to get those as soon as possible. Okay. 
the next couple of days. That would be great. All right. So this is the monthly snapshot for September of 2019. <laughs> You're a little bit like... So everybody what? out in the hall could right. hear at the time, yeah. yes. Oh. Um, <laughs> So you will receive this in an email. It will be posted online um, so that you have this and it's accessible to the public. It will go online tomorrow. So when we look at our September sales tax collection, we saw an increase of September over September 18. I would like to note that this is actual over actual, not compared to budget. So we are comparing actuals here. And September 18 to September 19, our collections were up by 7.1%. Again, September collections represent all sales or collections from August monthly filing. So this is still summer sales. Um, and then our sales tax collections were up September 18 by a total of 4% over September of 18. So this, when we're looking at this, this is broken out a little bit different because you can't compare 18 to 19 with all of our sales taxes together because we have the new half cent tax. So until April of next year, you'll see this report with the 3% and then the five, half a percent broken out. So we have our sales and use tax and then our lodger's tax. Our lodger's tax is up 16.6%. Use tax is up 4%. And then again, our actual increased year or month over month from each year is 7.1% increase. Do you have the year to date numbers for that also? I asked our, I asked Diane Gersh for that, so you will get that in the email. We'll be adding it to ah. this, but I didn't have it when this started. Okay, thank you. So, um, we, well, and we do, and it's right here. So, the in, for the general fund sales tax history, we are looking here at just the city's sales tax of 2%, not the dedicated revenue. So, this is the 2% that goes into the general fund. I asked for the whole thing. But yeah, because well, yeah, the year to date would be September, not well, right, that's this. Yeah, but then you're adding into that total, you're adding October, November, and December, so you can't compare well, them. You can't both. compare, right. So we're up 7.1%, that's showing here, it's the consistent throughout. When we look at the trends, we are trending above, um, and it falls in line with our month to month to month. We haven't had any catastrophic events this year, knock on wood, we will not be having any. Um, but you can see when we get into, um, Lodger's tax here towards the end, there is a little bit of a change um, when we're looking at last year and the 416 fire. We do have the report broken out by SIP code. I wanted to make sure that you had the information about outside um, other Durango. So when we look at this report, um, they're by zone, we have a map, but the outside city limits is where you'll find your online Retailers, sales That's tax. Only the state portion, correct? And not correct. So we're also collecting. We are collecting what, what, what the uh, the groups that are doing it voluntarily. Correct, voluntary remission. Right. So that is 10.67 percent of our sales tax. So online retailers and retailers that are selling to individuals within the city limits that have their base business outside of the city limits of Durango. So that's 10 and half percent of our total sales tax. When we look, look at our lodgers tax, so we're here over in September, we're at the dark blue line right here. You can see the 2% lodgers tax, we are up this year 16.6%. Again, this is sounds like a huge increase, but when you look back at 2018, we did have the impacts of the 416 fire. So it's kind of more appropriate to look at the 2017 number. So at 142,000 and change in 2017 for September, we're at 146,000 and change for September of 2019. So we're still trending in a positive direction, but it's really not when you're apples to apples with no 416 fires. Not quite the 16.6% increase, but we're still trending up. 
The other thing that we've added to this report are the capital projects of $5,000 or more, and I have these broken out for you. 500,000? These are 500,000 or more. This is not the full report. This is just the breakout that we did for the monthly snapshot. So when we look at these, I wanted to call out a couple of projects. So you can see that in this year-to-date actuals, so there's a couple of projects that have zeros, so no money has been spent so far, and I thought it would be important to touch base on some of those. So the Florida Raw Water Line replacement, their current, white, current efforts underway at the Headgate structure with the backup supply plan for the Florida Pipeline. Um, and that needs to be taken care of before this project can get started. So this is a project that is waiting for the, pre the project that comes before it to finish up before we can get moving. When you look at open space acquisition, we touched on this a little bit today, but again, the money that's appropriated in each year occasionally can be held back, accrue the money, and then a large purchase can be made, which is more than the annual appropriation that does roll into that project fund. Amber, would you, um, this is helpful. Do you have capacity to also provide us with the information on the date it was appropriated? Not right now, but in future? Yes. Thank you. I think it's helpful to know how long. It's been out there. Is yeah. that the entire fund balance? I mean, so there's $500,000 allocated every year? This year there, yes. So there's only 700000 in it? Yes, that would be what, year to date budget. That's what's in that budget what did, code. What did we buy? Because it was 2.5 million. I don't know. I'll have to double check with All right, thank you. Kathy. Um, there's been no purchases that I'm aware of. Th yeah, yeah, there's been no. So that could just be the budgeted amount. I, I don't know. We can find out. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, open space acquisition, okay. Then we have the limited storage lift, space, lift station vaults. This is tied to the lift station replacement project um, that is moving forward. So that would be this one, 2031. So 2031 needs to be completed. So the preliminary plan for the Leitner Creek lift station has been submit to CDPH&E. And the plan for the upper Ramada lift station is currently in development with Dewberry Engineering. So this project combined with 3030, or 2031, which is that guy right here. Um, will be implemented. So both of the new lift stations have to include emergency storage, and those are the notes that you'll get in your CIP third quarter report. River City Hall, the Swinging Bridge, Art Trail, that one is moving along fine. Ridges Basin Water Treatment Plant, Plant Main Extension is on here, and there's been no progress on this. There's an RFP for preliminary engineering that needs to be completed, and that's Project 1112, which is also on this list. No, it isn't. It's smaller than $500,000. It's in the other document. So I'm not sure how council would like to have this information. I don't think that it's useful to run through every single CIP project in front of the public on TV because it will take a long time. Um, and I'm not quite sure that that would be useful. So I have the document and we will be posting that online tomorrow. And that's the third quarter report. I will make a request to staff that we include a column for when each of these projects are appropriated. And I would like some direction from council on the whole as to what you would like to see in your monthly financial update related to capital projects. So I, I appreciate this. I think it's important to show it to the public. I would think, as I mentioned, having the date, it was original approval. And I also think you should highlight those that not only are at zero, but if you go back up some, some of them are like a 800, I'm looking at the swinging bridge, you've got an $800,000 appropriation. And does that mean 26 has been spent? 26,000 yeah, to the top. Sorry, oh. yes. You're so, doing encumbered. And then the year-to-date available. Is so you're looking at 50000 out of an $800,000 right. project has been spent. So I think it would you know, use the discretion, not just the zero right. expenditures, but some that have a significant um, the low end or insignificant, maybe is what I should say. We're not really Moving. looking at completing that in any time soon. Okay. That sounds great. Um, so we will make those changes. Thank, Thank you. you for bearing with me. I'd like to just make sure that we're getting the right information out there um, in an understandable fashion.
I do have two other questions for the council um, related to future meetings that relate to my report. And that would be, um, we will need to schedule a meeting for your evals with the judge and the city attorney. And typically that is done in December. So just as a heads up, you if you can, we'll send some information out to council and then get those scheduled. Um, and then the other one is, is that in order to move forward with um, making sure that our audit happens on time, I would like to receive approval from council to move forward with issuing an, an RFP um, for an auditor. And that would be council's selection of the auditor, but we need to make sure we can hit those procurement timelines. So I hear consensus on that, so thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much. Is that all? That's all. <laughs> thank you. Okay, moving on to council reports and actions. Councilors? I have, uh, I have an item. If I can uh, just talk about, uh, I had an opportunity as your mayor pro tem to travel well outside my comfort zone. Uh, I was asked to speak at the Transgender Day of Remembrance. Uh, last Sunday evening in recognition of over 400 tragic murders of transgender folks, that's their term, uh, that were uh, very visually and uh, eloquently discussed by members of our community uh, at the Universal, at the Unitarian Church. Uh, I reiterated the city's policy of civility first and discussed the training and commitment of our law enforcement and every department of government to uh, provide a, an accepting and inclusive culture in our community. At the end of the ceremony, uh, the attendees signed the official transgender flag, which is this beautiful flag right in front of us here, uh, to be uh, displayed at Fort Lewis College. Uh, Dr. Jude Harrison offered me uh, another flag, this flag, uh, which I have signed and will ask and or encourage uh, my fellow counselors to add their signatures uh, to, be, uh, to be offered and displayed to our Community Relations Commission for their events. So this will be in our, in our office and add your signature at your will and at your convenience uh, for use by our Community Relations Commission. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I, Councilor Noseworthy and I attended a court session in this room the other day with Judge Casey presiding, and it was very interesting. Uh, one of the things, beside his very, very, um, I don't even know what word to use, it's an amazing way he handles people. It's incredible. Um, but beside that, I also realized that I need to pay more attention to my driving and my bike riding. Um, <laughs> I don't want to end up uh, sitting right down there and talking to the judge. So um, it was a very, very interesting experience. I'm sure Barbara will have more to add. Um, and it was very, um, I learned a lot. And I, I just respect Mr. Uh, the Judge Casey very much. He did a great job. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, we had the plastic bag people here earlier. And one of the things that I completely support that they have been doing is making uh, alternative to plastic bags. I love the idea. And I was given one. This is a t-shirt. And what I love about it is if you notice, it's a Superman with Durango underneath, right? So we're super Durango. And what's coming out of the top of a snowflake. And I just think this is fabulous. So this is my alternative to plastic and I'm very excited about it. I um, attended a couple of meetings recently uh, along with uh, uh, Councilmember Brookie. I attended the Transgender Day of Remembrance uh, with my husband and it was extremely moving and um, I just felt that it's important for us as a city to be present for those kind of um, ceremonies and so I appreciated that. I was also attended the uh, Climate Cities which the Mayor Pro Tem also spoke at along with others from LPEA, and there is a growing enthusiasm and commitment to renewable energy and to addressing climate change. And so I just, again, see that strongly in the community. Uh, I also attend, went to hear, uh, to watch Judge Casey uh, in his duties, and I'll be going back a couple more times before that evaluation process because each day is different. So, uh, Mondays are one kind of activity, Wednesdays are another, and Friday is a, even a different kind of day. So I will uh, do my best to get in there and be able to uh, provide a uh, 
an appropriate evaluation having witnessed his activities. Excellent. I want to just thank the Parks and Rec Board for allowing me to attend by phone. That was a first for me with them, and I was able to contribute to the meeting. We discussed, obviously, uh, things that we've all been discussing, so I'll bore you with that about the budget and reconciliation. And then uh, the Chamber Board meeting uh, this morning, and just wanted to bring to the attention of everyone their eggs and issues. They're sponsoring Thursday, December 5th at the Double Tree Hotel from 8 to 10 a.m and it's on moving the needle on health care costs. And it's an update from the Southwest Health Alliance and Peak Health Alliance. This is a group that's formed by leaders and uh, community members, health care providers, insurance representatives throughout the community uh, in an attempt to lower health care costs in Southwest Colorado. They'll be giving an update on their progress. And I would uh, encourage everyone to attend. It's a very interesting concept they have going that's worked well in other places in Colorado. Excellent. A um, couple things on my, Mr. Nelson, it, would it be appropriate to have, get an update on 5G? Actually, we have been spending some time as staff looking into 5G, um, and I will commit as a staff and to continue to do that. I don't have a formal report. Um, generally speaking, I've been engaged with the special counsel that represents the group that the city is a member of, a consortium. Uh, his, uh, Ken Feldman, who was a very well-known telecommunications expert uh, in the legal field, and uh, preliminarily he indicated to me in the strongest of terms that the city uh, does not have the authority to impose a moratorium, but we will continue to explore, I, I, and I'm aware of the communications the council's getting about this topic, so you know, I will commit along with the rest of staff to continue to explore uh, those issues and report back formally, but I don't have a formal report for you tonight. But you'll keep us informed as well. I will do that. But I appreciate that update on the moratorium. Mm -hmm. So, so you, that, that was the question, it was on whether or not we could do a moratorium. Is that, that was... Based on the best advice that I've been able to get, because I, I will confess that I'm not an expert in these telecommunications matters are quite complicated, but um, the information that I've been given is that because the in some of the more times that you hear about or in other states, we have a specific state law in Colorado that uh, ties our hands largely to restrict the use of certain rights of ways for certain purposes. Um, so on that basis, their advice is that we uh, don't have the authority to impose a moratorium. That doesn't mean we don't have any authority at all, but generally speaking, uh, I think, it, again, the opinion that I've received is that we don't have the authority to do that but we can explore any other options that might be available to us, and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Blake, I'm wondering if you can give us an update. There was, there's been some discussion around email policy to advisory boards if it comes to city council. Oh, right. So we have a process in place where when, we, when council receives an email and we see it, then it's forwarded to, so let's say it's about the 32nd Street Bridge. That email is then sent to the Parks and Recreation staff to be put into the public record on either whatever the topic is. And so there's running comment, public comment logs based on whatever issue is being commented on by department. Um, so there was a request to send a specific email to the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. And so during our mayor's meeting, we had a little conversation about what the current process is and how the boards receive that information. So what we're doing now is we're compiling all of it and then it'll go forward to the board when the board is discussing the items um, rather than inundating the board's email inboxes with all of the emails that council is receiving and that we were also being fair because then all of the emails are going in one document versus here's 55 emails on whatever subject or saying oh this is a good one let's send this one on because we want to make sure that the boards, if the boards are making recommendations to council, they have the information. Amber, that would be inclusive of uh, comments that we, any of us receive individually or in aggregate? Or if just... you receive an individual comment, right. that's just to you. Dean gets a comment 
if you don't send it to me and forward to me, then I can't send it to staff because I don't know you've received it. And therefore it doesn't become and therefore it, public record. I mean, it's available through a Quora request if it's a tier city email address. No, we want um, to get to the right spot, yeah. But so. if it's just, set in it, but if it's sent to the city council. So um, we, we probably should talk about this um, a little bit more, but uh, there's has been, um, a conversation um, that the staff person for the for a city advisory board did not forward an email or more than one email that they received concerning a project that the advisory board was working on to that advisory board because it was sent to them personally. And I think there's more to this conversation than just what we're talking about. Right, and I think that it's with you and Barbara, am I correct, on the kind of subcommittee group working on boards and mm -hmm. yes. commissions? Yes, yes. So it advisory would be, boards, or advisory yes. board, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, it may be a pertinent conversation, and I'm well, assuming that that'll yes. likely be part of your That's conversation right. to say, yeah. add that to the list, and it's yep. how does that communication work? Because then we can make sure that our that processes like? as mm -hmm. staff right. are communicating under the, appropriate expectation mm -hmm. perfectly and it's fair and, and it's consistent. Yeah. Um, and we have established protocols so that would be great to add that to the list and i think you so you mentioned there's a public log correct mm -hmm. that we're they're all stored so there's logs so if i if you ask me for comments on okay. eighth and college then i would contact sarah and ask for the public comment log and there you go I think this is extremely important. It, it also brings up the larger question of uh, all communications, yep. uh, email communications specifically, uh, amongst ourselves and amongst uh, uh, our constituents, and and making sure that becomes public record and is moved on to the appropriate board, staff, whatever, and and uh, and it's done in an appropriate manner. That's not doesn't become a serial meeting, and uh, so I think we need to kind of revisit that. And I'll be asking for that. Uh, to be post uh, placed on a study session next year, okay. uh, I guess at this point. I'm assuming uh, it will come up with boards and commissions. Yeah, well, I'll propose well, it next week, and our people can yeah. weigh that, in. That, 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 but he's talking about a different uh, situation. Oh, email he's talking about communications. Right, right, right. Yeah, but just an overall communications uh, to update. Your, to your point, you know, I had a conversation with um, Mr. Nelson about snail mail mm -hmm. because we do receive snail mail, mm -hmm. and I don't know that we have a process for that. So I understand there is a process, but I can't describe what it is right now. And I think that because I spoke to Karen briefly about that, because she's the one who handles that. Uh, but I will confess that the present time I forgot to get back to her and ask her. So okay. I will do that. But but I understand there is a process that it happens when the mail comes in, it gets opened, it gets uh, you know copied and then distributed. So maybe Amber knows more about it than I do, but. I just neglected to get back to her and ask. So well, I know you raised that question. Maybe we add it to the conversation that mm -hmm. Dean wants to have since it's yeah. about communication. Uh, Great. Uh, uh, yeah, and we can uh, add that to my yep. uh, suggestion next week. Yep. Thank you. Well, I am. Uh, I have a few more updates if you guys are done. <coughs> uh, just on um, council reports and actions before we move into for future potential agenda items. Sorry, I'm so sorry that I missed some of these events that took place uh, due to travel myself, the diversity. I'm sorry I missed that event. Um, but I did travel up to the CML uh, Mayor's Summit, which was great, in Denver. Um, I think they had some really excellent breakout sessions on effective meetings and the appointee evaluation process, which I, I, I felt uh, very comfortable con contributing to that conversation. Team building with councils, strategies for around affordable housing, and uh, we were able to add to that as well um, with our recent LIHTC funding um, for, for affordable housing. So it was a really great opportunity. I had lunch with Kevin Balmer, um, and who is the executive director of CML, and it was just really nice opportunity to get out and talk with other communities about issues they're facing, um, and uh, it made me actually very thankful to be in Durango. Um, because um, some of the issues that some of the larger communities are facing are, are tough for council. So it was really interesting. A um, Couple other things, I, I wasn't sure if anyone had information on the public comment for e-bikes this Wednesday. 
Well, I'm attending the meeting. And where is it? It's at five <laughs> o'clock? Five o'clock at Rec Center. Can you tell just a bit about that? So it's a joint board meeting and um, there will be public there will be a board meeting and then there'll be public conversation as far as I understand right five to six is the board meeting so four o'clock is the multimodal board right. meeting and that will be held at the rec center okay five o'clock is the joint board meeting that will be held at the rec center in the large room and then at immediately following the joint board meeting there will be the public parks comment. and recreation no no I think I thought it was an open, I thought it was a public comment meeting after A that. public comment meeting. There's three three meetings yeah. in a row, all at the rec center. Start at six, the public comment meeting, okay. I think. Well, you, you, okay. I, the e-bike meet, the joint e-bike meetings at five. five. Yes. Okay. Because I think that's important, um, lots of conversation around that. And then we have a 416 recovery celebration tomorrow night, which is going to be a really nice opportunity. It's Wednesday night um, at the Strader Hotel, 5.30 to 7 p.m. And it's an opportunity to honor our community heroes who, uh, who led their teams in fighting the fire and, um, and serving our community, and also to talk about um, our recovery and restoration efforts on the ground today that's going in place. And we have a, a quite a few local uh, heroes that we will be recognizing from the city of Durango, um, as well as La Plata County, and guest speaker Rob Powell, who was the type one um, yeah. captain section chief. Um, so that's going to be a really great event tomorrow night at Strader Hotel. Um, and that's all I had. So let's move into future potential agenda items. Does anyone have anything? Sure. I have a couple. Um, first of all, I'll be, I'm going to be pretty much out of commission for the next 10 days, though I will be taking emails and phone calls. So since I can't go to uh, the multimodal advisory board meeting to which I'm at liaison, I've asked Councilor Baxter to go and, and uh, in my stead and represent me there. So one, I'd like to ask for a study session on plastics mm -hmm. sometime in the new year. That was on I my think, list as well. I think <laughs> that uh, we've got a great demonstration. I think that 1,200, and I appreciate uh, the community effort around that. Mm -hmm. The second one is, um, there, I think it was Kathleen Barrett made a comment about a resolution or the city council in, engaging with them and also with ICE. And I'd like to learn more about this. I don't know if it's a study session or if several of us go and, and actually chat and report back, but I, I think we have a responsibility to look into that, and I just don't know the correct process. Um, I'd like to also, there's a couple of things. Um, one of the first comments, and Dirk knows this, and so I'm gonna bring this up, is one of the first things I asked of both the city attorney and the city manager was that we didn't have a whistleblower policy. And I have worked in other places where we did. And so uh, in the co in conversation with Mr. Nelson, we kind of came back with, it would really require council direction to pursue that. And, and I can say there, there are templates that exist. I, in nonprofits that I serve on, we have, a, we have a whistleblower policy. So I think that's particularly important that we think about. And to that extent, and then I have a few more items, is I don't know about the rest of city council, but I did receive a a letter, and it was unsigned, but it did make some um, accusations, and I don't know how to proceed. And I, I take it that it's unsigned in part because they're, they're, I'm assuming that there's not a whistleblower kind of p possibility. So I'm not certain how to proceed with this, um, and I would seek counsel from, I don't know if anyone else received the same letter, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think we all did because I think it came through our mail and was copied to all of us. Through the snail mail. So I would like some guidance from either the mayor or the mayor and the city attorney or something of what might be an appropriate uh, response. Did you see the letter, Mr. Nelson? I, 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 I gave him a copy, I yeah. Did. I didn't see it, yeah, I didn't see it initially, but I've seen it since, so. I would have a tendency to want to defer to you on that type of uh, the only thing I could suggest is that we have uh, some staff follow up. Again, if this is something that would need some direction, but um, it's possible, I think, to have some low-level investigation in the nature of just following up a little bit and then um, reporting back. I don't, I don't have any other specific suggestions on that. This is an unusual kind of situation, so. Unusual, I just feel as though we have to have some action that looks into it in some way, shape, or form. I, at least that would be my own thought that you can't just completely ignore it. Perhaps 
the interim city manager and I can discuss some options. And that would be great. Mm -hmm. Good. That would be helpful. Mm -hmm. So uh, also on my agenda is a possible site, a discussion about a possible site for a homeless camp. This is in follow up to our joint uh, meeting with the uh, county commissioners. And then finally in the new year, uh, and I think it might require some staff direction, I'd like to look at contingency fund best practices and um, capital improvement projects best practices. Um, I think it's always important to learn what the industry proposes and what others are doing. And I, I think that might be um, helpful for all of us. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have, excuse me, I have one more. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. When we met with the ju uh, Judge Casey, and then again, this would involve possibly directing uh, the city attorney, he had a suggestion of looking at the possibility of decriminalizing some of our ordinances uh, due to the jails in particular being uh, flow overflowing. So I think that might be a discussion between you and the, and the, the judge, but I can't necessarily direct that. I will say that he and I and the prosecutors have had this ongoing discussion for quite some time. Uh, some municipalities are moving toward that for a variety of reasons. So it may be that you wouldn't want to decriminalize everything, but there's certain, certainly some things that could be done. So that would be a project, I think, for the new year. We would go through that process, but um, can certainly explore that idea. Excellent. And uh, I'm just going to kind of just follow up to absolutely. Councilor yeah. Knows, where these um, list. What I was thinking, I, I was looking at Amber, Ms. Ms. Blake, I think we should get another updated um, calendar list for the new year. And I think it might be helpful for us to possibly talk about scheduling a uh, an, an, a study session at the beginning of the new year where we where we prioritize. Thank you. Um, and I've, I've been involved in those discussions in the past with past councils where we have four quadrants and we we um, organize our schedule accordingly. And I think that's going to be imperative for us to do that because I think we have committed to. Um, to try to stop with the double meeting headers. And I think, um, Amber, you had information on that that I, I you did. should share. Um, because I think it's pretty me. impressive the work we've done. And so we want to get back on track with a, a regular schedule. Um, and so I, I was May I clarify, I'm not asking for a whistleblower study session at all. I think the city attorney just needs consensus from us mm -hmm. uh, and direction to pursue uh, looking into that. So it's not a study I'm at looking at. I just. I think it's very important that I was speaking with someone yesterday, as a matter of fact, and, and um, the fact that we don't have a whistleblower process, mm -hmm. they were astonished. I, I would I would agree too. Okay. So perhaps well, if you could just look into that and that you figure list. out the best way to respond back. Yeah, we just need to. I but there's some, still some other good ideas that we should yeah. get yeah. calendar. Yeah. No, I, I, will, I, will I will do some research and then Thank I'll come back some more. Yeah. Do you have that in mind? I do. Um, so the standard scheduled meetings are 48 a year, council meetings and study sessions. We typically average, or looking at a five-year average, of 67. So there can be additional joint board meetings and all of those. This year, to date, we've had 84. So we current, we typically, the standard schedule is 48, a standard year is 67, and as of this meeting, we're at 84. Okay. A lot of extra meetings. Um, All right. Perhaps the perhaps the mayor should summarize some of the accomplishments that have come out of that. <laughs> we have accomplished a lot. Um, so, but but given that you know that I thought that was informa good information to share. Uh, it does it does show how hard we have worked. But we need to calendar some of these and prioritize them and move forward in that way. Um, Anybody else with um, we future We don't want to scare any items. future candidates. That's we, right. We don't want to, yeah. Yeah. It's really worth it, honest. <laughs> um, Council Bergen, did you want to add? No, well, I was in the realm of criminalization. That was one of the statements I offered to the Transgender uh, Day of Remembrance was uh, a review of uh, potential review council supported if that was the case of looking at our laws relative to hate crimes specifically. And uh, I made the statement that I'm, uh, I too am not, uh, don't have an agenda for additional criminalization of anything. Uh, I guess you're, you're in a tense heard me say that, and except for uh, hate crimes. Yeah. And I think uh, we heard uh, District Attorney Champagne talk about his commitment to uh, 
a higher level of enforcement of hate crimes. And I think uh, another one topic to, for us to discuss is encouraging a review of our laws relative to hate crimes and seeing if there's anything we can add teeth to and also uh, discuss it with our PD in terms of effective enforcement. And I think it's also incumbent upon us to understand what our PD already knows and the training that they've had uh, relative to uh, transgender 101. I didn't even know what that existed, but it's a uh, training that- uh, And 201. And 201, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's a really interesting uh, topic and it, it, it not only covers transgender issues, but uh, all kinds of hate crime and, and, uh, and discrimination of all time kinds. So I think it's really important for us to do that. But it, in, in balance, we, in one way, no, we I can totally foster decriminalization. I think, I think it's a totally appropriate thing for us to be looking into more. Thank you. Excellent. So. <laughs> Do we have more to add to our list? Yes, the suggestion was made that I that I that I present my list in, yes. in this forum. Yes. So this is what this is what I'm doing. And Amber's got her pen handy. Well, I can send her a copy. Of it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we'll make sure they match. <laughs> so um, it, 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 we're talking about capital reserves, CIP reserves, and all sorts of other things. I, I think that one of the biggest conversations that I've seen in advisory boards and other um, areas of conversation is that we don't have a clear, we use words in a way that maybe for some people works because they've used those words all the time, but for other people coming from a different um, perspective, those words don't mean the same thing, such as operations, maintenance, capital improvement projects, capital replacement projects, new capital projects. I mean, so I think that having a conversation around what do these things really mean so that when our advisory boards are having conversations about is this maintenance or is this a CIP or is this this? They're not um, struggling with what's the definition, which muddies the entire conversation. They're, they are able to know here's where we are. And I know that there are some definitions about things in different departments, but I do think that this might be a really good thing to either revisit if we visited it before or to have a very robust conversation about what, what do these things really mean so that we can um, move forward and not be arguing about the words, mm. but discussing the At projects. the council level, like in a study session, is that where you're suggesting? Uh, yeah, because I think that's where the direction is going to have to come from. It's okay. going to have to come from council to the boards and also the staff about what we're thinking. And okay. of course we would get staff and advisory board involvement in this conversation somewhere along the way, but yeah. Okay. Um, I also, um, uh, I, as I sometimes have a tendency to do, I jumped on board a uh, project that, uh, you know, I have been advocating for the upgraded standard of the art trail. And one of those sections that's incredibly problematic is the section behind the high school. And one of the, uh, it's problematic because of the um, condition that it's in, but it's also problematic because apparently uh, CPW um, needs to do some spring work there before we can do our work. And so as, as a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, um, concept, I wanted to meet with CPW and understand exactly what's, what their needs are and why they can't get it done and what their challenges are and how we might support them making it happen so that we can then step up and make our part of it happen. So I was hoping that council would support that concept. Um, it's not, um, it's, it's not, so it's, it's with the concept that staff would help educate about, you know, there would be staff level conversation, but there's also peer level conversation. So um, I would hope that we could do that so that I'm, because I'm, we've been working on this for years and we're not making any progress and I don't know why. And I'm hoping that maybe just a different kind of conversation might help with that. I think that's a good idea. I have a little insight to the operation and uh, I think that would be a really effective uh, method of communication with CPW. Okay, so yeah. do we? Do you I think peer to peer is great. Okay. Amber, do you have thoughts? As long as we're making sure that the history of years of staff work of working with CPW is, you know, included in the conversation so that when we continue those conversations to get the projects done and, 
you know, it starts moving and we're back in the picture as staff that we can continue doing what we need to do. I just want to make sure that there's no, that everyone continues to be on the same page, right. kind of along right. the same lines as the well, uh, that's why I terminology. Councilor uh, Baxter and Well, the original proposal was that staff, Scott McLean, would accompany me right. for that purpose. And, and there's there's agreement, I believe, from, from staff that that's a way that we could move forward. I think, I think a coordinated conversation works great because then it can be a more productive conversation rather than separate conversations. Then, yeah, that sounds... If that's okay. And I was approaching it from the idea that I'm like one of the biggest voices complaining about what we're doing and I want to help make it different. So. It's, it's taking responsibility for my position of trying to do something. I appreciate I that. I do have one other question, though. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think in this case, like Dean said, this this might be the right solution. I think we do need to be careful about using your political hammer and expending the political capital. Um, and then I do, and we'll talk about peer to peer, um, just in terms of vernacular and what the definitions are. I think if. If you ask staff, we might consider ourselves peers of the people working as staff at CPW. And so policy maker to policy maker, peer, like staff to staff. So just making sure that we're, at least we know where we stand and what role we're playing. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. And my yeah. intention there was to, to find out what the challenges are and then to go beyond that to have convers further to, conversation, further conversation, a higher level about are. what the challenges are. Because until I'm informed, I can't have that conversation. Right. But I like peer-to-peer, -peer, that's awesome semantics for nudge. That's, but, uh, <laughs> that was nudge. my semantic for yeah. nudge. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, I think we'll find that our peers are not in Durango. No, and uh, I, I, I don't doubt that. No, but I can nudge. start at the top yeah. if I don't know what I'm talking about. Right. So. Um, so the other thing that I would like to talk about, which has kind of seemed to have fallen off the mark um, somehow, is the use of Santa Rita Park. Um, and there's a, there's a, it's tied in with numerous different things. And, and the homeless um, situation, uh, the idea of putting the homeless camp at the tech center is tied into the idea of using the Pepsi site for s snow storage. And all three of these are tied in in many ways. Um, for example, Parks and Rec needs storage, uh, particularly because the Mason Center is falling apart. So if we did somehow do some sort of way of dealing with the Pepsi site, and we could also, the, the sheriff will be moving his gear out of there sometime, hopefully around March of 2020. Um, it's, it's heated. Uh, it might have great Parks and Rec storage. It might also be a great location for the Bacter storage for the next year until we talk about what we might want to happen at Santa Rita Park, whether we do Bacter building and police station. What, you know, what kind of plans do we want to do? We want to put Parks and Rec storage there? I don't know. So I would like to, I, that's a really big conversation with multi pieces coming in together. So I think we should consider that. Um, Quick question for you, Kevin. Does Twin Buttes have an affordable housing agreement? Does who? Twin Buttes. Mm -hmm. They have a compliance agreement that requires them to meet the same 16% of the development in the community. It's not under the fair share ordinance, though. It's a standalone agreement. And it's, did you say 16%? It's a voluntary transfer. Yeah. There's a but they don't have to build affordable housing. The, there's not an easy, quick answer here. They have a commitment and a development agreement to meet the same 16% as all the other developments in the community that do for sale housing. So 16% of their housing 16. has to be affordable? No, they have to meet a 16% commitment, which could be paid down in any number of ways, through transfer fee, through development of units, through donation of land. Uh, the compliance agreement has been in, in immensely tricky at Twin Buttes, and we are still uh, not done having the conversation about ultimately what it looks like. Their 16% is met over time, so we have, you know, what do we got up there? Probably 15 homes and then a, another couple buildings full of condos. Right. So we're just getting started, uh, but it can be met in any number of ways as you, um, we just talked about. Thank you. I just had a community member ask me about that. The transfer fee is part of that equation. Right. Okay. As I recall, the original master plan up there did have, in fact, some allocated sites for uh, affordable housing. Uh, but to date, uh, 
Those haven't been there is a, Those there, been There's a parcel that was identified for a multifamily building. The conversation with the previous uh, administration over there, if you will, the development team, uh, they wanted to just build it. And the, the new group, there hasn't been a lot of conversation about that right now because they're busy putting up homes to sale. So it's still on the table for discussion. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Kevin. Councilor Baxter? I'm going to try to keep I, us I, on track. Guys. Can you clarify the Santa Rita? Because you went from Santa Rita to um, like Pepsi building. Yeah, so we have numerous needs, mm -hmm. and we have numerous areas that those needs might be met. Okay, so can we just put it on the calendar? And yes, and okay. that is already on okay. staff's list Thank of you. discussion. Okay. Thank you. Santa Rita We're not going to solve that now, guys. Yeah. Okay. Is so are we going to have are we going to have a meeting? You said we're going to have a meeting early in the year that I would like to. things. So can we bring up more things at that point in time? Absolutely. Then I'm then I'm done. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. If you want to send me your list, it'll help me. Yes. Probably we we got more time. Do you have anything? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good. I think <laughs> the agenda is pretty full. <laughs> right. And I do not either. Councilor Brooke, are you done? Okay, future percent. All right, with that, I believe that that brings us to the end of our meeting. Our next meeting is not until Tuesday, December 3rd, when we will have uh, the, I believe, final budget on the approval on, on the agenda. Yep. And I do want to thank our PIO professionals, Victor Locke and Mitchell Carter in the back room. Thank you for bringing us live on DGOV. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. Yeah,